After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. John chapter 19 and verse 38. I speak to you in the name of our crucified Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Joseph of Arimathea, the third and final character of the trilogy of whom I will speak today, he was a respected man of the same Sanhedrin of which Caiaphas was in charge. Remember, the Sanhedrin was the Jewish religious council, which was the highest ruling body and court of justice among the Jews at the time of Christ. And it was led by the high priest. And Joseph was following Jesus clandestinely. He was a disciple of Christ when Jesus was teaching and ministering while on earth. However, the secretive nature of his discipleship was because he feared the Jews, especially the religious authorities, finding out that he, and he, he was fearful that they would find out that he was following Jesus. It would not be a good sign if the religious leaders who wanted to get the rid of our Lord had found out that one of their own was actually believing and following this man. That would probably have been grounds for expulsion from the council. Joseph was from a small town called named Arimathea, located in the Judean hill country bordering Samaria, about 25 miles from Jerusalem. The fact that Joseph was able to go directly to Pilate to claim Jesus' body after the crucifixion tells us that he was a man of great prominence, that he had great influence. He was a man who would have been highly regarded by the community and the authorities of his day. Luke's gospel refers to Joseph as a good and righteous man who had been waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. Luke makes it his business to mention that Joseph, as one of the members of the religious council, did not agree to the plan or the actions or the shenanigans of the council. So all the scheming that the Sanhedrin did, getting Judas to betray his own master, sending the police officers of the temple to arrest Jesus as if he was a bandit, the charade of a trial and the demand for Jesus' execution at all costs, forcing Pilate to do what they wanted even when the governor knew that Jesus, the Christ, was innocent, inciting the crowd to choose Barabbas over Jesus, the Christ, to be crucified, the walk with the heavy cross on the Via Dolorosa, the sorrowful way, the route which Jesus took with the cross from Pilate's judgment hall to Golgotha, the stripping of Jesus' clothes and the nailing of him to the cross in humiliation, all these aspects leading up to Jesus' death was part of the action plan of the religious council, the Sanhedrin. But Joseph 
from Arimathea stayed out of the fray, not agreeing to anything they were doing or did. He probably felt that those who were against Jesus could easily be against someone who stood up for him. And Joseph did not approve of their actions, but neither did he object or disapprove of them. The scriptures do not tell us if Joseph ever said or did anything except to make a request for Jesus' body after he died. And this must have been a stressful occasion for Joseph and for his friend Nicodemus, who was also a member of the Sanhedrin. And like Joseph, he was another secretive follower of our Lord, coming to speak with him at nighttime on one occasion. Nevertheless, these two men must have been watching all that was going on and were in disbelief. And yet they didn't say or do anything. Remember, there were only two of 70 members of the council. And yes, Joseph believed in Jesus. He followed his teachings. He had the opportunity to challenge all that was going on, the proceedings, the claim of blasphemy. He could have even told them not to act irrationally. After all, he knew Jesus and he knew the charges they brought against him were not true. He could have even done what the Pharisee, whose name was Gamaliel, did by advising the council not to kill the apostles when they wanted to do so in the Acts of the Apostles, citing that if these men are of human origin and what they do is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, then we will find ourselves fighting against God. Acts chapter 5 and verses 35 to 39. Joseph knew that they were about to put to death an innocent man, but he remained silent. He was like an individual who heard something being said was untrue and decided not to get involved just to let it go so as not to be ostracized by the others. He acted somewhat cowardly in this instant to stand up for the person in whom he believed. How many times have we done the same thing? Afraid to speak when we know things are going wrong or someone is being accused wrongly and we know they're innocent and we refuse to say something or do something. We decide not to get involved in fear of being alienated. We allow the individual's character to be tarnished or the person to be spoken ill of when we know what was being said was untrue and we did nothing to help. How would we like to be accused wrongfully and know there was someone who could speak up on our behalf in our defense, but they refused to do so. Leaving us to be found guilty of a crime or circumstance we didn't commit or had nothing to do with the matter. Nevertheless, Joseph will turn around his cowardice, even at great risk, to himself. He goes to Pilate to inquire about Jesus' body so that he could care for it and to give it a proper burial. Joseph wanted to prevent his friend Jesus from suffering the shame of the aftermath that was typically associated with such an execution. For in those days, criminals were not given burials. They were left to decay in the open with wild animals having a feast as a result. 
No wonder the place was called Golgotha, the place of the skull, because skulls and bones of those who were crucified were there. But by requesting Jesus' body, Joseph opened himself to alienation. He and his friend Nicodemus opened themselves to being ritually unclean by touching a dead body, for they took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. By asking for the body, Joseph was accepting responsibility for that burial, and Nicodemus assisted him in providing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. Joseph demonstrated his love for Jesus after his resurrection, even though he was afraid to stand up for him at the trial. He knew that although he was not courageous enough to prevent the death of Jesus, he felt that at least he could make up for his cowardice by giving Jesus the burial he deserved. And in addition to placing Jesus in his own tomb, Joseph showed his belief and love for Jesus and became a faithful disciple of our Lord. And incidentally, the church celebrates the Feast of St. Joseph of Arimathea on August 1st. My friends, the cross made a difference in the life of Joseph. The once cowardly, secretive disciple of Christ was bold enough to go to the governor to ask for his friend's body. He was no longer afraid. The man who we may consider a weakling became confident enough to withstand whatever it may have cost him by agreeing to bury his friend. This member of the Sanhedrin came to the realization that with the cross, there is no such thing as exercising your discipleship in a secretive manner. Being a disciple or follower of Christ is not something you do behind closed doors, closed doors. Remember Jesus said, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Jesus died publicly so that all may come to know him. The disciples, after he had died and risen and ascended into heaven, went out publicly and boldly into the world to share the good news of Christ. They did not do it secretly. And yes, at times they needed to go underground, but they continued and the church spread and Christianity spread. So discipleship, my friends, is never secretive. It is never private. It is bold. It is public. And Joseph of Arimathea realized this, and he would have recognized it even more when he found out that his own tomb was empty again. The Lord, the one in whom he believed, had risen Joseph turned his private secretive expression of his faith into a public, bold demonstration of his faith. And that is what the cross did to Joseph. And that's what the cross can do for us if we take the meaning and the power of the cross seriously. That the meaning and power of the cross is love and joy, peace and patience, kindness and goodness and gentleness. Once we are able to take the meaning and power of the cross seriously and to live it, realizing the magnitude of the love that Jesus exemplified and demonstrated on that cross, you would want to share your life and relationship with others, no matter where you are or who they are. We will want to share our convictions, 
not, our, not as fanatics, but as lovingly, caringly, patiently as possible so that others may know Jesus and see him through us. And thus we are called to recognize and acknowledge Jesus in the way we think and speak and act and to share his love with others. In the end, Joseph of Arimathea was able to demonstrate his love for our Lord and to exercise his discipleship with boldness. Are you willing to do the same as well?